let's switch gears. I spent a little more time trying to put together our sermon from earlier today on uh, is there a doctor in the house? Hopefully there was some something in that sermon that people could Amen. appreciate and learn from. But I didn't have enough time to work on our regular uh, study in the book of Hebrews. We're currently studying the book of Hebrews in this hour, or Sunday school hour. We're studying the book of Nehemiah on Wednesday nights. So, uh, but today, since I didn't have enough time to prepare our study in the book of Hebrews, I'm going to switch gears and cover something that um, is familiar to us because we, we talk about it a lot, at least it should be familiar to us, and that has to do with the Bible and the Catholic Church. The Bible and the Catholic Church. When we discuss Roman Catholicism and Roman Catholic doctrines, and try to compare it with the scriptures, we're not doing so to be mean, we're not doing so to attack other people. We're comparing what we read in the Bible with what is taught and what is claimed by the Roman Catholic institution, the Roman Catholic religion. When my wife and I were uh, just dating, my wife-to-be, I should say, she had recently gotten saved, but she had been raised in a very devout Catholic family. So devout, in fact, none of them even came to our wedding when we got married. They were told not to come because I was not a Catholic. This is how devoted they were. <clears throat> now, fortunately, her mom, who was the head of the family at that time and had forbid her other children to attend our wedding, eventually got saved. Uh, my wife led her to the Lord about a year before she passed away and uh, took years to get her to Calvary, but she's saved and now in heaven, and I look forward to seeing her again. But I, I said to her at the time, I don't have all the answers to your questions, but what we can do, when we would go on a date, I said, well, we can read the Bible together, and you take what you read on the pages of the scriptures and compare it with what you were taught growing up and you trust the Holy Spirit to speak to you and tell you what is right and what might be wrong. And let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. It is if he lives in you and he wrote the book, he's the best one to teach it to you. He can teach it to you better than any man can, anyone else can. Um, so, and you know, I believe that most Roman Catholic people, those who are uh, devout enough to attend their church regularly. I think they want to believe that their church is based on the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Their church claims a certain belief in the scriptures. The Roman Catholic religion claims that they are responsible for writing and giving the world the Bible. And so I think most Catholics want to think that their faith, their belief, is solidly based on the plain meaning of the scriptures. But is it really? So you raise that question, people think you're going to attack Catholic. I'm not going to attack any Catholic. But I am going to ask you to turn with me to a number of places and look at what the Bible says versus what the Catholic Church has always claimed and maintained. I'm going to call your attention to four different subjects. And uh, if you're watching our sermons on the Internet, you should have a Bible. If you have a copy of the King James Bible, you can turn the pages as we go, follow along with me and with everyone here in our church. Uh, write the scripture references down if I don't give you enough time to turn to them and look at them on your own and see if what you read on the page of the Bible squares with what you might have been taught growing up. And uh, that's my endeavor today. That's my intention, I should say. And uh, I'm gonna ask you, first of all, to turn to Mark chapter two. Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2. And 
And uh, I'm going to start there with verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. That means four men carried a sick man who was on a bed or a cot stretcher. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, that is the crowd pressing in, they uncovered the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Palsy was a, a form of crippling or arthritis, some paralysis in a limb or part of the body. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, parentheses, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine own house. And, he, and immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And the first question I want to pose is this. Can a priest forgive your sins in the confessional? This is what is claimed uh, in Roman Catholicism that, and, and they'll justify it, they'll explain it this way, sometimes you need another person that you can pour out your confession to and tell them exactly what's been going on, knowing that they'll keep it secret, they won't reveal it, but they can assure you that you are forgiven. And the priest doesn't simply tell you God has forgiven you. He says, I absolve thee. I forgive thee. So he presumes to stand in the place of Jesus Christ and forgive your sins. But according to the Lord Jesus, there is a test that needs to be passed first in order to justify someone forgiving your sins. They asked, who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus asked them, he said, which is, e which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven, or take up thy bed and walk? Well, it's easier to tell someone your sins are forgiven. Who can prove they are? Who can prove they aren't? But he says, if you can heal a sick man, get him up on his feet, a lame man, get him back on his feet, miraculously, then maybe it's a safe bet you might have authority to forgive his sins as well. That's the test. Christ gave that test, and he said, so that you might know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say to the, he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. So he said, that to justify what I'm saying about forgiveness of sins, I'm doing these miracles. So unless a man can raise sick people, crippled people, back up onto their feet, just like that, you have no reason to think he can forgive your sins either. If he can do the one, then maybe he can do the other. But never take their word for it. You see, this is the test Jesus set forth. He set this test one, and this account is also recorded in Matthew 9 and Luke chapter 5. You have three of the synoptic gospels all stating the same thing, that unless a man can, uh, with, his, with his word, raise a crippled man back on his feet again, he probably can't forgive your sins either. All right, let's move on. Are we supposed to recite the Lord's Prayer? Turn back to that text, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This is right in the middle of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, so forth. 
Matthew 6. We'll read the text that everyone seems to know. I'm always amazed when I see some church program at a, a memorial or funeral service, and they have to they print the words of the Lord's Prayer. It's almost a given that just about 99% of all Americans have heard it before and can recite it back. <clears throat> Why some church thinks there might be that 1% of people out there who are ignorant who actually come to this way of print for them. But be that as it is, let's read the text, Matthew 6, and verses 9 through 13. Jesus is speaking to the disciple, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You'll notice that what's called the Lord's Prayer wasn't prayed by the Lord Jesus. First of all, he says in verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, not let us pray together. And he said, after this manner, it's a pattern, it's a model, it's an example of elements a prayer should uh, consist of. He did not say, repeat after me, ready, begin. He said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And then he listed a number of things that your prayer ought to include. Thanks to God, request for your daily provisions uh, and, and uh, protection from sin and, and temptation and so forth. But notice what he said just before that, verses 7 and 8. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Jesus said, listen, when you pray, don't just repeat the same thing over and over again. That's what the heathen do. They think the more they say it, the more God's attention they'll attract. But when you pray, pray something like this, after this matter. And he listed those elements in the following verses. And yet, the Lord, right in the context, the one prayer Jesus said, don't just repeat the same thing over and over again. That's the very prayer people insist on repeating over and over again. You'd have to be a blind man to miss that. A text without its context is a pretext. You use it, taken out of its context, to try and prove or argue for some conclusion that's not justifiable. So he said, don't just say the same thing over and over again. Who can't do that? But when you pray, pray something like this. And yet, you can go to a Roman Catholic church, and the priest will say, let's pray together in the words our Savior taught us to pray. And they recite the Lord's Prayer by rote, just ritually. It's a regular occurrence. It might be once, twice, sometimes three times during the course of a Catholic Mass. I've witnessed it. When all else fails, just fall back on what you memorized when you were in catechism class. And call that prayer, and enough said. But it's not really prayer. How many of you were Roman Catholic before you got saved? Anyone here? Well then, my wife would, is not feeling well today, but she would uh, raise her hand as well. And now that you're a true believer, you know that's not real prayer. Something that takes about 20 seconds to recite can't be classified as real prayer, especially when the Apostle Paul says, uh, pray without ceasing. Are you going to repeat this round the clock for 24 hours and call that praying without ceasing? No. So you know that's not real prayer. And my point in making, or my, my purpose in making that point, for the sake of Roman Catholic folks who might be watching our videos, is not to be offensive, but I want you to see from the scriptures, if you're looking at the scriptures with us, that what you were taught might not 
match what's laid out plainly on the scriptures, on the page of the Bible. The words of the Lord Jesus himself. And I can't think of a higher authority to teach me how to approach God, how to talk to God, or how to think about God than the Lord Jesus himself. God manifests in the flesh, right? All right, let me move on. Let's go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Go forward a little bit to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. I'm going to take on four subjects. We may take on a fifth subject if we have time for it. John, chapter 6. And we'll read verses 53 through 56. John 6, verses 53 through 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my drink, or my blood, is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. That's where the Catholic apologist, that's where uh, Catholic catechism texts will stop. Verse 56. Um, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. In the Roman Catholic Church service, called the Mass, the focus is eventually getting to the, the conclusion of that service where the priest transforms the wafer, the bread, and the wine into the human flesh and the human blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not merely a symbol as we view it. They believe that he really changes it into the actual flesh of Jesus, only the appearance and the taste of bread remain for convenience sake, I suppose, and, and of wine. But does it really become the flesh and the blood of Jesus? This, in effect, is how a Roman Catholic gets Christ in him. Christ said, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. We believe that when you're saved, Jesus Christ comes to live inside of you. In Roman Catholic interpretation, the way Christ comes into you is you eat that bread, which has now been transformed into his human flesh. That's how you get Christ in you, literally, physically, materially, by swallowing little pieces of his human flesh that have been miraculously transformed by the power of the priest. And if you're lucky enough to get a sip of that blood in the cup, wine. And usually uh, the church members get the wafer and the priest drinks the wine. But once in a while they will uh, allow church members to come up and each one take a sip. Although for sanitation purposes, I don't know that I'd want to drink from the same cup 35 people before me had just put their lips on. Anyway, be that as it is, is it really the human flesh, and the human blood of the Lord Jesus. In Lanciano, Italy, it's a northern <coughs> town in northern Italy, there's a church in which they claim about 500, 600 years ago, a priest was having his doubts about whether the elements truly transformed into the flesh and blood of Jesus. And something caught his eye, something about the, the bread and the wine looked a little different to him, and uh, upon examination, they decided that it, was, it had been transformed into real human flesh and real human blood. And so they've kept it in a crystal um, container, or a monstrance, which is the thing that holds the wafer and something else to hold the wine. And uh, it's been there as sort of museum pieces for the last 600 years. And they, they'll go so far in this tale to tell you that modern Experts have looked at it with, with um, medical science technology, and they've determined not only is that human flesh, that actually came from cardiac tissue. It was part of Jesus' human heart. And that, whatever that is, has uh, uh, dried up or congealed in that 
other container is real human blood. Now, without trying to be offensive, someone like me has a natural suggestion. Why not extract DNA from it and see what we get? You know, just put it in a, uh, a host uh, 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 that's, that's fertilized a, a, an egg and see what comes of it, if it's real human DNA, geogenetics. But let's just suppose for the sake of argument that that really was human flesh. That really is human blood in that crystal container. Who wants to stick that in your mouth? Who wants to eat that? Jesus said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So it's not doing anyone any spiritual good sitting in those containers. Someone has to put that in their mouth if they want to get salvation. The Catholic Church said in the Council of Trent, 1546, um, that if anyone says that this is just a symbol, that Christ isn't truly present in body, blood, soul, and divinity, the entire Christ, are contained in those elements, let him be accursed. But is it truly his human flesh and his human blood? The Catholic apologists will say, we take the scriptures literally. They take it literally when the language is clearly figurative. It's symbolic. And they'll make something symbolic, like God created the world in six days when they should take it literally. They have it sort of backwards. At least that's our perspective. That's our viewpoint of it. Is it truly literal? Verse 53, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. But in the same chapter, I'll give you three arguments against their interpretation found right in this very chapter. You won't have to go to any other chapter of the Bible to argue and refute the Catholic interpretation of the real presence, the changing of the elements. Look back at verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The way you eat and drink Christ's flesh and blood is by coming to him and believing. It's a spiritual matter. Christ told the woman at the well uh, in John 4, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's a spiritual matter between you and God the Father by coming to him and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with putting something in your mouth only to be digested and the natural elements of, of elimination take over after that. That's argument number one. Look back at the text that we read earlier, John 6. And he says there in verse 56, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And that's where the apologists will stop. But look at verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, even so he that eateth me even he shall live by me. Is there anyone that thinks the way Jesus Christ had fellowship with his heavenly Father was by transforming bread and pretending to eat God the Father? No. So if that's the way you're supposed to have fellowship with the, with the Lord God or fellowship with Jesus Christ, it can't be sticking something in your mouth or, or getting lucky enough to taste the wine. Why is that transformed wine still alcoholic? Why, is it, why do priests still get drunk drinking too much of it? Over there in Albuquerque, New Mexico, there was a, a halfway house called the Mission of the Paraclete, which is for priests who have developed drinking problems from drinking too much wine, or they have drug problems, or they have child abuse problems. They send them all out there and say, we'll handle it within our own church. We don't need the civil authorities getting involved. And they send these guys out there, as at least one place, to rehabilitate them before they send them back out. So why is it still alcoholic? Why does it still have the potential to um, control someone's 
mental faculties. It shouldn't if it's now been transformed into the pure blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the third argument would be here. Look at verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So even if it was real human flesh, it wouldn't do you any good. Christ said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. You get your eternal life by believing what you read on the pages of the Bible. You don't get it by some mystical practice or, or a superstitious belief that you can't fully explain, and if you ask uh, three or four priests, you'll get three or four explanations they can't fully explain. There are a number of things within Roman Catholicism that naturally trigger questions by those who aren't Catholic, or maybe a Catholic who pauses for a minute and says, is that really true? Do I really believe that? I want to find out for sure. But we would conclude, no, it's not real flesh and blood. It's only a symbol. It's only figurative. It only represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to ask one more question, see if we can't get the answer from the Scriptures. Is the Vatican, the Roman Catholic religion, truly Christ's church on the earth? Go, if you will, back to Matthew, once again, Matthew chapter 20. You'll notice that in all of these cases, we're reading the words of the Lord Jesus himself. We're not reading uh, one of the apostles' letter, uh, letters later on. We're reading the words of Christ himself in all of these responses. Natural questions are asked, and the position of the Catholic Church is fairly well known among Catholic members. But are these things true? Do they square with the scriptures? Can they be justified from the plain language of the Bible? And as I said earlier, I think most Roman Catholic people I know, most Roman Catholic friends you have and I have, you work with them, you go to school with them, I think they want to have some measure of confidence or belief that all the things that they believe in, the things that they've been uh, trained and raised to, to think, are sound and can be supported from the Bible. I think they really do. We believe, we believe that they've been sadly deprived of the Bible. And the tradition, the customs of the religion, the trappings of the religion uh, have crowded out uh, a simple faith in the Bible. The Lord Jesus said in the book of Mark, um, For well ye make the word of God of none effect by your traditions. Our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't require a special priestly class who wear special vestments to do their job. Uh, who have to have a special outfit on to do some spiritual thing. If it's a spiritual thing taking place, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. I have a friend, uh, I worked with a fellow, I should say. We went to a house to pick up a, a man who had passed in his home. And the family said, well, we're waiting for a priest to come and, and pray for him, give him the last rites. The man's already dead, but they were still, they had called around the churches asking for a priest to come before we took the man out of his home. So we said, okay, we'll, we'll go back, sit in our vehicle, and we'll wait. And we sat there for 10, 15 minutes, and uh, we saw a van or vehicle pull up behind us, and a uh, fellow got out, a priest got out, he's tell by his clergy shirt. But before he went into the house, he had to put on his robe and make sure it was on straight and everything in order to go to the house and administer the last rites for someone who had already passed away. You know, on the timeline uh, from life to death and eternity, someone who has died has already left this life and now they're in the realm of eternity. It's a little too late for you to do anything for them. But he couldn't even do that without the right costume on. And I thought, you know, I see it so clearly as simply 
phony and theatrical. There's nothing real there. Real there. It's just all symbolism, no substance. Why so many folks who are in that particular religion can't see it and say, I want to know the Word of God. But our faith in Jesus Christ doesn't require a special priestly class, and special vestments or special clothing. It doesn't require him to put his hands together like this when he prays, or to make the sign of the cross, uh, or sprinkle holy water on everybody, which just comes out of the tap. The holy water isn't, doesn't come from some special place. It's not shipped, you know, in well, glass bottles from the Vatican. It comes out of the tap. And uh, we don't require candles. We don't require incense. We don't need images and statues. We don't need all the trappings of stained glass windows and everything else to make us think that we're in a special place and something miraculous or mystical is about to happen at the hands of the priest. Our faith in Jesus Christ doesn't require or depend on any of those things. God gave to us only one physical, tangible object we hold in our hands and touch and read and by which we communicate with God. And he communicates to us. That's the Bible. Otherwise, we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't depend on the outward trappings that make us think something religious is happening and nothing's happening. But Matthew chapter 20, is the Vatican, is the Catholic Church truly Christ's religion on the earth? And let's begin reading there at verse 20, Matthew 20, beginning at verse 20. No, no, no. Oh, yes, that is the text. I'm sorry. Matthew 20, beginning at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. This would be John and James' mother. Uh, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Jesus answered and said, Ye, so he's addressing not just her, but her sons, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. He saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. He's foretelling their future deaths as martyrs. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten, the other disciples, heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them, all of them, unto, them, unto him, and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. The Vatican, or the, the city of Vatican State, or the state of Vatican City, I'm not, I can't remember the exact title, but the Vatican is the smallest actual country in the world. It's the headquarters of the world's biggest religion, and it's also the smallest actual nation in the world. So the Guinness Book of World Records, about 100 acres, but it is an entirely independent government within the city limits of Rome, Italy. And so it's a religion and it's also a political state completely joined together. That's why in Catholicism there is no such concept of separating church and state. The Pope is the religious head and he's also the political head. By the way, the papacy, the office of the Pope, is the last true monarchy in Europe. The other nations where they have royal families those are kept alive for old time's sake, right? Their bloodline, but they have no power. They've all adopted uh, republics or some parliamentary form of government. And the, the royal families and most other nations have no political control anymore. But in Europe, the papacy is the last true monarchy in Europe. Now the Pope isn't descended from a line of kings, but he's elected to be the head of that state. And he is served and waited upon like any king would be. And then they've elevated his status to say when he speaks, 
on a matter of faith and practice, he speaks ex cathedra. From the chair of St. Peter, he speaks infallibly. And he cannot make a mistake when he pronounces something on Catholic belief and doctrine. But the Vatican, as I say, not only is it a political organization, they have their own library, they have their own public works, they coin their own money, they have their own good an ATM in Vatican City, and it's the only country in the world that still uses uh, Latin as its official language. If you want to get your money out in Latin, I guess you have to understand Latin, use an ATM in the Vatican. They have their own police department, they have their own jail, uh, and so forth. They are an actual functioning government. When you think of uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion members worldwide, then you'll see that this is a global corporation. It's a hierarchical system. It starts with the Pope, it goes down to the College uh, of Cardinals, and under them the Synod of Catholic Bishops spread out throughout the world, and under each of the bishops, these different parish priests and deacons and religious uh, orders, nuns, monks, etc., and any other lay organizations among church members. It's a descending uh, hierarchical system. So it's, and Christ said, they that are great exercise authority upon them. They're in verse 25. Verse 26. But it shall not be so among you. For whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. The mark of a true Christian, the mark of a true disciple of the Lord Jesus, the mark of any true pastor is someone who seeks to give of himself for the sake of the spiritual blessing and benefit of others, and they to him. It is not to be waited on like I'm someone special, I'm someone important. I talked about Benny Hinn in my service earlier today. You should see the lavish lifestyles guys like him live by and enjoy. They have uh, chauffeured limousines, private jets, a uh, house in Orange County right on the beach worth about 11 to 15 million dollars, 7,000 square foot home. When he flies overseas to his quote unquote crusades in other countries, the Dateline NBC documented the places he stayed over, had a layover. The layover sounds like it was an inconvenience on your flight, but that's what they put in their log, a layover. They simply stayed at a hotel in Italy that cost $10,000 a night to stay in. Hotel rooms with indoor swimming pools, and uh, the, the most um, extreme or, or uh, gourmet food served, butler service, and you name it. This is the lifestyle of these guys. They're all charlatans and phony fakes, frauds, deceivers. And uh, thank the Lord for Nate for Dateline, exposing <laughs> guys like uh, Benny Hinn. But someone said to me once that the Pope as the visible head of the Catholic religion controls more wealth than the ten richest billionaires in the world combined. And when you think about that, it's true. They're a global corporation with a branch office in nearly every city, every neighborhood in the world. And this is just an aside, I'm going to bring this to a close after this. Several years ago, I decided I was going to conduct a little informal survey at my day job in the funeral home. Whenever I'd have a Catholic priest ride in the funeral car with me on the way to a, a cemetery, I would ask a question. I'd say, listen, I'm not a Catholic, but since you are and you're a, a, a representative of the church, maybe you have a good answer for me. I said, since the Roman Catholic Church is not only a religion, but it is also a political state, a government, and since there really is no idea of separating church from state like we think of here in the United in America, doesn't that mean 
that if someone is a baptized Roman Catholic, they are automatically a citizen of that foreign country. And I asked about four priests, and they got four different answers. One said, well, no. I said, well, why not? Well, they, they just wouldn't be. He couldn't really come up with an answer. Another priest said, uh, he didn't understand the question. And uh, one priest finally said, it's a Filipino priest visiting here in the U.S. for a short time. I asked him that question immediately. He said, yes, they're an automatic citizen of the Vatican. I said, even if they don't live in the Vatican, they have citizenship there. There are a lot of Americans who live abroad and aren't living here, but they still possess American citizenship. He said, uh, we, everyone's, uh, all baptism records are eventually forwarded to the Vatican, so they keep track of where their population is growing, where it's decreasing in other nations, to figure out where they can send relief and, for, and, and aid when there's a disaster or some medical need and so forth. He said, well, you're the first priest who I've asked who could give me a clear and direct answer. I always assumed that that was probably the case, but thank you for telling me. So some of you who were Roman Catholic before you got saved, you have dual citizenship. <laughs> now it's a, a, a laborious process to go through getting the church to take your name off of their rolls. So most Catholics who get saved and trust Jesus Christ and say, I, I don't need the Catholic Church. If I want, I have the Bible and I know, I know the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> they don't bother going through the trouble of officially getting their name removed because what does it matter? They have no power to bless me or curse me. They might be upset with me, but they, that's as far as they can go with me. And uh, it doesn't matter where your name is recorded as long as it's recorded in the Book of Life, right? Amen. Amen. 